Okay, so I've been asked to speak today to you today about heart disease and pregnancy. We actually have seen a surge at Mass General of pregnant women with heart disease, and as a result, uh, we now have a formal service, um, as you mentioned. So I have no relevant disclosures. So heart disease is actually present in up to 4% of all pregnancies, and data from the United Kingdom, which we can extrapolate to um, our country, suggests that heart disease is actually the number one reason, other than obstetrical bleeding, why a woman will die during her pregnancy. We're seeing more and more women um, older entering their pregnancies, and as a result, they may have pre-existing heart conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. We have, an, again, again, because of that, we have an increase in obesity and di uh, diabetes. Um, we also are seeing this huge population of women who had childhood congenital heart disease who may have passed away or may be too sick, but because of advances in surgery and medicine, are now living to the age where they can get pregnant. And these are people like with repaired fontans, you know, simple things like ASDs, VSDs. So we're seeing this population get pregnant. And also we're seeing childhood cancer survivors who normally would have died from their childhood cancer are now living to the point where they can get pregnant. We just had a woman who had an osteosarcoma at the age of eight, had multiple, um, she had metastatic osteosarcoma, multiple rounds of chemo, radiation, and she's, she just got married and she um, entered her, her pregnancy with an adriamycin cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy because of radiation induced fibrosis as well as mitral and tricuspid valve disease and you know our job was to help her safely get through her pregnancy so we're going to see more and more of these as well and unlike everything else in medicine there are limited to no prospective randomized control data so you're not going to be able to go into do a quick literature search a lot of this is based on case series that's why it's so important to understand the basic pathophysiology of pregnancy and how it affects the heart and if you understand that you can pretty much figure out how to manage these patients so I'm going to go over the basic hemodynamics of pregnancy, review the normal clinical and structural findings in pregnancy, how to risk stratify, so all diseases are not created equal when someone enters a pregnancy, review specific cardiac conditions, including I was asked to speak about peripartum cardiomyopathy, review the value of troponin and brain natriuretic peptide, and then discuss the importance of maternal placental syndromes. So this is how our service started. We, I got a call from um, the OB team. We had a 42-year-old who had a cardiac arrest and had an osteal LAD stent and in July of 2011. And then she had recurrent angina and needed another stent to her right coronary artery. Now, one thing is the person that was taking care of this patient never even discussed with her, is it appropriate for her to get pregnant or not? Because we're used to treating, we're used to treating you know, women who are postmenopausal. So no one talked to her. I guess the patient thought the next best step was to have a pregnancy. So she shows up three or four months after two drug eluting stents and is pregnant. And her due date is before the one year magic window where we, st um, we continue dual antiplatelet therapy. And the question is, how do we manage her? And so the OBs, um, because of this case, we, um, we formed our, surface, our service formally. Another patient, which was probably um, the highlight of my career last year, was a 32-year-old who was from Somalia. She saw one of my colleagues, who's lovely, and who told her, don't get pregnant, because she had rheumatic mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis, and aortic regurgitation. So she didn't like that recommendation, so she decided to show up four years later, three years later, um, to tell us that she was 15 weeks pregnant. So um, this was a um, cause of major anxiety for everybody last year, and she I'll tell you what happened to her. Okay, so this is the basics. This is what we really need to understand. So when you're pregnant, your blood volume goes up 30 to 50%. When you have a twin or triplet pregnancy, it goes up even more. And these changes start as early as eight weeks. Your blood pressure falls a little bit, then goes back towards normal at term. And your SVR, your systemic vascular resistance, falls. And this is because of your placenta. So your body's pushing blood into this low resistance vascular re re unit. So for some cardiac lesions, reducing your SVR is helpful, but for some it's actually not. Um, normally you have very little cardiac output to your uterus, but when you're pregnant it goes up to 12%. And then there's normal histological changes in your aorta, which I'll talk about. Your body has to prepare to push out this human being. Everything, your connected tissue all loosens up, but if you have aortic disease, that's actually not beneficial. Now then, the anesthesia people tell us, you know, we used to feel great. Patient comes into labor, great, we made it through the pregnancy, everyone's going to be fine. But actually labor and the first few days after is a very high risk period. So for example, a condition like mitral stenosis where you need a slow heart rate so that di you can fill the left ventricle and diastole, when you're in pain because you're having contractions, you're tachycardic, that does not help that particular lesion. Your blood pressure goes up when you're in pain, your cardiac output therefore goes up, as I mentioned, your diastole shortens. And then um, when you're pregnant, 
25% of your cardiac output can actually be reduced just from the baby compressing the IVC. When you take the baby away, all that blood comes back to the heart. And this young lady with the adriamycin cardiomyopathy, I actually was there in the delivery room because I just was, we were so invested in making this a good outcome for her. And I saw her JVP just go up like the minute everything, every, the moment she delivered. Um, then uh, so you get that huge increase in preload once you deliver. After you deliver, you have autotransfusion of all that blood in the uterus. Um, you can have blood loss. That low resistance placental unit, which is lowering your SVR, may have been beneficial, and now you're losing it. So suddenly you get this increase in preload. And then all that edema that you may have had now comes back to the heart as well. So labor and delivery and the first few days postpartum, you're not out of the woods. So a lot of our pregnant women, when they deliver, they deliver on labor and delivery, and then they come to the cardiac floor for monitoring uh, because we are well equipped to uh, manage these postpartum cardiac issues. So the problem with pregnancy is that when you're pregnant, you feel like you have heart disease. I was, for sure, I thought I had a peripartum cardiomyopathy when I was pregnant, because I noticed that there was a hill between the parking garage and the entrance to Mass General. And I was sure that my OB was wrong, um, but I guess I was wrong, um, because I was tired, I was short of breath, I was dizzy, um, you get a dilutional anemia. As I mentioned, the IVC um, blood flow can be limited, so 25% of your cardiac output can actually go down. And you have edema. What I think we should think about triggers that maybe think something is wrong is you have dyspnea that limits you know, normal activity, progressive orthopnea and P&D, syncope with exertion, palpitations. Now, palpitations are such a common finding in pregnancy, and I'll mention that to you. Uh, but I think generally we should not ignore that. Chest pain, of course, and hemoptysis. The same thing with physical examination. A normal physical exam in pregnancy would be considered abnormal if you were not pregnant. So, you know, this is a long list which is in your handouts, but the, what I do want to tell you is that, you know, obviously you can have flow murmurs during pregnancy because of the increased blood volume. Um, the JVP, because your blood volume is high, it'll be more prominent, but it shouldn't be elevated. And what should really make you think that something is abnormal is if you have tachycardia or bradycardia. Cyanosis and clubbing, obvi that's obvious. A diastolic murmur should generally be considered abnormal, and if you have a systolic murmur that is more than three out of six, or an S3 or an S4. Now you can definitely find a paper somewhere that says an S3 or an S4 is normal during pregnancy, but I think this is what should make you think that something um, it needs to be further investigated. So as I mentioned, not all disease processes are created equal. So the CARPREG is a, a nice study that was published in Canada um, over a decade ago where they looked at 500 or so women and followed them throughout their pregnancy, had a derivation and validation model. And the, the thing about the study is that 74% of them were congenital lesions, so maybe not representative of uh, the population of pregnant women we see, actually definitely not representative. They had 13% adverse outcomes, including CHF, arrhythmia, death, strokes. And they came up with this score, which is really simple. So basically, each of these boxes gets a point. And if you have a point of zero, your risk of a bad outcome is 5%. One point gives you 27%. And more than one point gives you 75% chance of something bad is going to happen during your pregnancy. So these points are, if you have a prior cardiac event, such as heart failure, TIA, stroke, um, or arrhythmia. If your baseline NYHA class is more than two. If you have left heart obstruction. So look at these numbers, mitral valve area less than two. That's only mild mitral stenosis. That's because you're putting 30 to 50 percent more blood through this small valve, and then you're increasing your heart rate. So uh, mitral stenosis is not well tolerated during pregnancy. Um, I actually had a patient referred to me who had mitral valve area of one, but because she felt well, she was told that it was okay for her to get pregnant. That's the type of person that dies during pregnancy. And a lot of our um, women from other countries. I don't know if we are population here, but in Boston we see more people from, you know, um, Haiti and, you know, Africa. They don't even know that they have these lesions, and then they present when they're pregnant. Um, and then the aortic valve area is less than 1.5. So again, that's only moderate aortic stenosis. So again, you're pushing more blood through the aortic valve, um, and that just doesn't help um, the hemodynamics. And reduce ejection fraction. So each of these gets a point, and if you have more than one point, then your, your risk of an adverse event is 75%. So my 32-year-old from Somalia um, had two points. So she had a really a, a risk of something bad was going to happen. She was actually asked to terminate her pregnancy, and she declined. Um, so I'll tell you what happened to her. So because the CARPREG scoring system is, is mostly congenital lesions, the WHO came with a more all-encompassing um, classification system. And these are basically 
WHO 1 to 4, 1 is better, 4 is worse. And these are, so WHO 1, these women generally do well during pregnancy with a low, no risk of mortality, low risk of bad things happening like CHF and arrhythmias. So pulmonary stenosis is actually very well tolerated, unlike the left-sided stenotic lesions. PDA is mitral valve prolapse, ectopic beats, those are pretty low risk. Um, then we get down to unoperated ASDs, VSTs, repair tetralogy, and most arrhythmias. Then we get into W02 to 3, where there is an increased risk of maternal mortality, um, where, for example, heart transplant patients, hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, Marfans with a normal aorta, and valvular disease that's not severe. Then the threes are definitely people we, we are more concerned about, so mechanical valves, systemic right ventricles, Fontan, cyanotics, and patients with dilated aortas. Now, if you think about that one or two percent of our population has a bicuspid valve, of which a lot of the young women don't know they have that, and, and when they don't know they have it, they may not know that they have aortic dilatation. Some of these women might be entering pregnancy with aortic dilatation and they don't really know it. So um, that's another aortopathy issue. And the WHO4s are those women who are generally advised not to get pregnant because they have a, a significant risk of maternal mortality. So pulmonary artery hypertension, low EFs, NYHA 3 or 4, previous peripartum cardiomyopathy with residual impairment, severe MS, severe AS, Marfan's and bicuspid with large roots, and severe coarctation. So these are women that pregnancy is contraindicated. Now again, we had um, Dr. Al Kayyem from California, who's like one of the gurus of heart disease and pregnancy, come speak to us. And he says, you can never tell a woman pregnancy is contraindicated because it's a very personal decision, right? Basically, you can tell them the risks that are they're facing and you know people are going to get pregnant if they want to get pregnant just like my lady from Somalia she's specifically told not to but she did so it's it's we can't say all encompassing you should never get pregnant but it's a decision that hopefully these women are seeing preconception so they can re their risk can be determined before that so um, the European Society of Cardiology um, have created this um, uh, database worldwide to try to understand, because there's no randomized controlled trial, they're trying to um, recruit women across the world who have heart disease and pregnancy and kind of help define how to better treat these women. And so there's now actually almost 3,000 patients in this registry worldwide, which is a huge study in pregnancy and heart disease, and we're now a member of this registry. And basically, this is just to show you that they tracked women and their mortality, so WHO 1, 2, 3, and 4. Your maternal mortality was only 0.4% if you're WHO1, up to 4% if you're WHO4. And then the, the fetal outcomes track that. So your fetal um, death was only 0.4% if you're WHO1, but almost 6% if you're WHO4. Um, birth weight obviously is lower the sicker the mother. Pregnancy duration is lower, if uh, depending on how sick the mother is as well, and preterm birth as well. So um, contraceptive counseling is a tricky business. I guarantee you that my card cardiology colleagues, especially the um, older ones, are not talking to any of the women about contraception. because We're just not used to dealing with that in cardiology. But according to our guidelines, it's actually felt to be our duty to discuss contraception with our patients, our, our young women patients. Um, and obviously you need to balance the risk of unplanned pregnancy versus the risk of the contraceptives. The WHO again came up with a nice classification scheme. Um, so you have to weigh the risk of fluid retention and thrombosis with the estrogen progesterone versus the um, um, you know versus um, IU, the benefits of IUD preventing pregnancy. So basically, they say WHO four should not get or oral contraceptives. WHO three also should probably not get oral contraceptives, and they probably should get IUDs, though the risk is a risk of vagal reactions at the time of implant, and for some of the cyanotics um, women, that's actually can be a pretty serious um, situation. But again, at cardiology, we don't usually rec talk about birth control, but we need to at least bring it up and say talk about it with your OB or your um, primary care physician. So as I mentioned before, um, the aorta, um, there's normal changes in the aorta that helps um, loosen up all the connective tissue in your body so you can push out this baby, but when it comes to the aorta, it's not beneficial. They've done studies on pregnant women who were healthy and who died and looked at the aorta histologically, and there actually was fragmentation of the reticular fibers, loss of the normal corrugation of these fibers, and the circulating elastase breaks up the elastic lamina and weakens the media. And um, hemodynamically, when you're compressing the aorta with your uterus, that can cause outflow resistance of the lower arterial tree. So pregnancy is a high-risk period for all women with aortic pathology, and um, the dissection occurs most often in the last trimester or the first few months postpartum. So you're not out of the woods just because you've delivered the baby. So the guideline recommendations for Marfans, in, if you have someone who's Marfans who wants to get pregnant, and you can see it's, it's a little bit, there's no general consensus because there's really no good trials. 
But the Europeans suggest that if your aorta is over 45, you should fix that aorta before you get pregnant because you're, there's a risk of dissecting once um, during pregnancy. The Canadians also use 45, and the Americans use 40. Again, not based on any really good trials. The best trial, though, was uh, published in the Journal of the American Cardiology a few years ago where they looked at 69 uh, women with 200 pregnancies, these are women with Marfans, and they compared them to women with Marfans who didn't get pregnant. And what they found was is that um, the aorta increased by three millimeters during their pregnancy and did not go back to normal. They had two carotid dissections, but they had no aortic dissections. The one patient w um, with a root of 49 had a rapid increase in her aortic regurgitation post-delivery and needed to um, have her um, aorta fixed. And they basically came up um, with um, two important issues. So if you're a pregnant woman with Marfans, your risk of needing elective surgery was 13% versus if you're a pregnant a woman with Marfans who never got pregnant, it was as low as only 6.5% and there was no adverse outcomes. And if you got pregnant, there was a 23% chance you had an adverse outcome. So what you can tell your, your um, women with Marfans is that pregnancy will increase the chance you're going to need surgery and have an adverse outcome. And the, yes? No, preg surgery later, over their lifetime. And the factors associated with long-term cardiovascular outcome was obvious things. So the bigger aorta, the more likely you were to, to need a surgery in the future. The number of pregnancies, obviously. Prospective care, so if you're followed by a cardiologist, you actually did better. Beta blockers actually helped. And obviously, the bigger the aorta, the, the worse they did. So we have very, very little data on roots over 45 mm millimeters, so it's generally advised not to get pregnant. If you're under 40 millimeters, you're expected to be pretty low risk. The bottom, the bottom line you can tell your Marfan's patient is that your aorta will increase when you're pregnant. It will not go back to normal. And you do have an increased risk of long-term adverse out, uh, outcomes compared to a Marfan's woman who does not get pregnant. But you have a low risk dissection if your aorta is less than 45. Now the bicuspids, which is someone we're more likely to see, there's absolutely zero data out there. And 50% of patients with bicuspids have dilatation of the ascending aorta. And there's, again, as I mentioned, there's no good studies out there. Though the American Thoracic Guidelines suggest that if your root's over 50, you should fix your root um, before you get pregnant. But this is not based on any data. It's just based on some people coming together in a room and deciding that. So when we see these women, we follow them closely throughout their pregnancy with echoes every you know, one to three months. We potentially would give them beta blockers to decrease the aortic shear stress. And we generally would tell them that they can have a vaginal delivery if the aorta is not that big. Um, and consider a C-section when the aorta is over 45 millimeters. But this is all patient individualized decision. We meet with our OBs, um, our MFMs regularly and talk about how we're going to manage these patients peripartum. And if you've had a previous dissection, that um, uh, should be advised against a pregnancy. So just to change things up a little bit, this is a call I got a year or so ago from the obstetric service. It was a 35-year-old who's in preterm labor at 35 weeks, and this is the EKG that was performed. It was read by one of the OB fellows and was read as normal, and I can't really blame them, but in retrospect, from my cardiology eyes, there probably is a little bit of ST elevation here in the precordial leads, though the baseline is wandering. So they went on to deliver her because of fetal distress, and immediately um, after her C-section, she started coughing. And so think about hemodynamically what's happening. The baby's out. All that uterine blood is coming back to her heart. The, um, uh, the, she loses that preload. The afterload is now gone. So basically what's happening, she's having an increase in afterload, increase of preload. She's in pulmonary edema. So um, she had a bedside troponins and a bedside echo that showed anteroapical wall motion. So she basically had an acute MI during labor, delivered, and um, was in congestive heart failure. So this is a, um, the only really good study we have on the use of acute, uh, acute MIs during pregnancy. And it's 95 cases. And majority of the patients were over 30, so the older women. It's felt to be about a 1 in 16,000 deliveries worldwide. And high incidence of the known risk factors like hypertension, diabetes, um, hyperlipidemia. But the, the morta maternal mortality rate is 11%. So you think about of our acute MI coming through the door, 11% mortality rate is really unacceptable. So that's that's how MIs were treated decades ago, 9% um, fetal death rate. And the pathophysiology was stenosis in 40%, 8% thrombus, 27% um, coronary dissection, and 2% spasm, and 13% were normal, though I suspect these normals might actually have been small dissections that, were not, um, that they weren't able to see with regular cath methods. 
So this is her, this is the, um, the lady I just spoke to you about. So she went on to a cath, and this is her optimal coherence tomography of her LAD. So this is basically a catheter down her left anterior descending artery. This is the um, intima, and you can see that it's nice, 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 and then there's a break. So she broke, she basically had an intimal tear, so she had a coronary artery dissection. And this is all hematoma all along her artery. So, so the same with aortic pathology. Coronary artery dissection is, is more likely to happen um, when a woman is pregnant. So this is um, Dr. Hayes in Mayo has the best data out there on coronary artery dissection. And she looked at 87 patients. And the mean age in her group in general was 42. But 18% of these women were postpartum. So that's, you're talking about 20% of women who dissect their arteries are pregnant or postpartum. They were younger and occurred up to a month or so postpartum. And um, they, what they found was they actually had fibromuscular dysplasia in other territories, like the carotids, the renals. And there was a 17% recurrence rate, in, and the recurrence only happened in the female patients. And the 10-year mortality was 7.7%, and major adverse events about 47%. So you're taking a group of young women who just have had a baby, and their outcomes are really not, you know, we, we want to do better than that. So this is probably one of the most important slides I'll talk about today, CPR during pregnancy. So um, if you're more than 20 weeks pregnant, the IVC, as I mentioned um, already, reduces venous return um, and preload. So you want to move the mother a little bit over to her side so that the blood can come back to the heart. If you want the baby to be viable, you have to deliver within five minutes. So on our cardiac floors where we have these women, we um, have a, the stat number for OB so we can call them and they can come right away if we need to deliver. And five minutes is not very long. Anoxia in the mother occurs earlier because the mother's lungs have less functional residual capacity. So the mothers do worse if they have a cardiac arrest. Consider magnesium toxicity. Obviously, they're on magnesium. And the only difference with the chest compressions is you want to put the hand a little bit more towards the head because the heart shifted over and up a little bit. Now, if you look at all the cardiac drugs for CPR, ACLS, just use them all. Just use whatever you can to you know, resuscitate the mother because the baby's not going to survive if the mother's not going to survive. Um, amiodarone, um, which is part of our protocol, is not recommended in pregnancy, but just use it. You just got to save the mother and do whatever you need to do. So all of that, yes? Yeah. consider viability. How many weeks? So um, I guess you, you talked about your OB, but we usually use 24 weeks. Yeah. yeah. OK, so this young lady that I talked about that dissected her coronary artery, her troponins were elevated. And so the question is, is that normal? Are we allowed to have elevated troponins in pregnancy? Should we just ignore it and say, oh, she's pregnant. Her blood volume's up. You know, she's under more stress. So again, it's not really been very well studied, um, but generally troponin should be in the normal range. They may rise to the upper limit of normal, and they may go a little bit higher in the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, such as preeclampsia, but I would never consider it normal. You need to figure out why the troponins are elevated. And the same thing with brain natriuretic peptide. So you would think that when you're increasing your cardiac um, output and your blood volume by 30 to 50 percent, your, your heart enlarges. Echoes show that the LV does increase during pregnancy. Your BNP should go up. That's what we'd expect, but actually, it's generally not supposed to go up more than normal. Preeclampsia can bring it up a little bit higher than normal, but again, don't assume it's preeclampsia. You still need to figure out if there's an underlying um, reason why the BNP is elevated. And the, again, the Canadians did a nice study studying BNP in pregnant women with heart disease. So they enrolled 66 women. Again, as I mentioned, these are small studies, uh, but this is the best we have. And they looked at 12 healthy controls of women who are pregnant without heart disease. And they did their BNP several times during their pregnancy and postpartum. And basically what they found, so the heart disease patients are in red and the controls are in blue. None of the healthy women without heart disease had an elevated BNP over 100. The patients with heart disease did have, did have elevated BNP. And in total in their study, there was 13% adverse events. The peak BNP was over 100 in all the women that had an adverse event, and, but it only predated the event in 88%. So my young women with anthracyclin cardiomyopathy, I actually followed her BNP during her pregnancy to kind of, because it's, sometimes it's hard. You know, these women, their bellies are getting bigger, their JVP is more prominent, though it shouldn't be elevated. And it just kind of to help me decide when and if she's um, going into CHF. And so I tracked her BNP, and, and when it, when it went, goes up, you can actually, that's when it, you think that, you know, the volume load, the heart's not dealing well with that extra volume. Now, so if you, but if your BNP is normal throughout pregnancy, it's 100% negative predictive value that you have no cardiovascular outcomes during your pregnancy. So it's 100% sensitive, 70% specific. 
And if you use that card preg risk score that I used, talked to you about, so left heart obstruction, low EFs, um, um, symptoms, previous cardiac events, if your card preg was zero and your, and your BNP was less than 100, you had no events whatsoever, and only 8% of your BNP was over 100. But if you had one of those card preg scores, um, six, and your BNP was up, 60% of those women had an adverse event during their pregnancy. So this can kind of help risk stratify further. All right, so shift completely, because I have a lot to talk about in an hour. I'm going to talk about prosthetic heart valves uh, quickly. So we like to see young women, obviously, preconception to discuss what type of heart valve they're going to get if they're contemplating getting pregnant. The, obviously, the beauty of mechanical valves is that they last longer, but you're anticoagulated, and um, then we have the risk of warfarin and anticoagulation during your pregnancy, which I'll talk about in a second. Biprosthetic valves have a higher risk of structural valve deterioration just because of the pregnancy, um, because of the burden um, on the heart valve. Um, but we really don't have a lot of data on the newer heart valves that are, are out there. And I, I guarantee those big valve companies are not studying pregnant populations you know, w with a lot of detail. Um, so this is what warfarin embryopathy looks like. So um, there's a flattened nasal bridge, bony deformities, you can see part of the bones are gone. CNS abnormalities, they have lower IQs, um, bleeding, spontaneous abortion, and optic atrophy. So if, I'm going to talk to you about the guidelines. The guidelines do recommend warfarin at some point during your pregnancy, but MGH, our OBs do not use warfarin whatsoever. Like, they, they won't even talk about it. They've had some bad outcomes with um, uh, fetal bleeding, intracerebral bleeding. They don't use it at all. Um, I know, though, that we have some OBs from other parts of the country, like California, where they do use it, but we're just, we're, it's not even in our hands. Our OBs won't allow us to use it. So. Mechanical heart valves are an issue because when you're pregnant, you're more hypercoagulable. So if you're going to thrombose your valve, it potentially could happen, more likely happen during pregnancy. The beauty of unfractured heparin and low molecular heparin is that they do not cross the placenta. And in a large review, the risk of valve thrombosis was felt to be lowest with warfarin. So if you took warfarin, you're only 4% chance of clotting your valve throughout pregnancy. 9.2% with unfractured heparin in the first trimester and then switching to warfarin and 33% with unfraction heparin throughout pregnancy. I think the problem with the study is that um, there's lots of criticism about it. They really didn't follow the factor 10 A levels. And um, so what we recommend now is, I actually just have a woman who has a mechanical mitral valve who just got pregnant. I'm not allowed to use warfarin because my OBs won't let me, but I'm following her factor 10 A levels pre-dose and post-dose. And it's amazing. I, I dosed her Lovenox based on her weight, which would be 60 Q12, and she's actually on 100 Q12 because her factor 10A level was low, it was underdosed when I just used her, um, her body weight, probably because the changes in the, you know, the distribution of uh, Lovenox because of the increased blood volume. So I think we don't really know, there's really not good data, but if you're going to use Lovenox, you need to do factor 10A level pre-dose, and I make her do that, and then gives, she gives herself her dose in the lab, and then four hours later she comes back for another factor 10A level. And it took me about two weeks to get the dose right, but now she's like just perfect. And the dose we want is we want the pre-dose to be over 0.6 and the post-dose to be less than 1.5, and that's exactly where she is. So these studies didn't do that. I think if we did that, the risk of valve thrombosis would be much lower. So if we're just thinking, yes? Do you know if most women who receive uh, those nocturnal during pregnancy uh, have factor levels monitored or are they I, expected? So I don't think they do, and I think that's where the data comes from. I think that's one thing we can change with the process, because um, like I said, if I didn't monitor her levels and just use weight-based Lovenox, she'd be underdosed throughout her pregnancy, so we need to do that. So if we're just thinking about the valve, we just we want to just give warfarin, but obviously you need to think about the mother and the baby. Um, now, there's, there's felt to be a lower risk of warfarin embryopathy if your warfarin dose is less than five milligrams. And they actually did this crazy study in Europe where they took women before their valve replacement and put them on warfarin without any need to and decided what their end warfarin dose is going to be. And if their warfarin dose is less than five milligrams, they gave them mechanical valves. And if their warfarin dose is over five milligrams, they gave them mechanical valves. Um, but the problem is, is that even if your dose is less than five milligrams, it's not 100% that you're not going to have warfarin embryopathy. So this is the ACCP guidelines on how to manage antithrombotic um, use during pregnancy. So one of the following. So twice daily low molecular heparin throughout pregnancy. Now they recommend measuring the peak 10A levels. We actually recommend doing the peak and the troughs. And Dr. El Kayam, who came from California, that's what he does as well. And he's really the, the he's, he's done a lot of the landmark studies in this field. Or BID unfaction heparin throughout pregnancy following the PTT. Or using a heparin until the first trimester is over then switch to warfarin, and then go back to a heparin closer to delivery because you can st stop it. 
And if you have a high risk for thrombosis, warfarin throughout pregnancy um, and then replace with a heparin closer to de delivery. So the, our most recent patient, as I mentioned, as soon as she found out she was pregnant, like within a week, we stopped her warfarin and put her on Lovenox. And our plan is to do that until she's at 36 weeks. And then we're going to put her on unfractured heparin sub-Q. And again, as I mentioned, our obstetricians don't even give us an option. So we're not allowed to use warfarin. So this is a true case of a woman I saw about a month or so ago. She's 35, she's first pregnancy. She's 38 weeks pregnant, and she came in with shortness of breath, edema, and orthopnea. So, you know, we've actually got some calls to our, our triage nurses, and women call all the time, especially in their first pregnancy, and say, I'm short of breath. Like, I mean, how do you decide who's sick and who's not sick? Um, so um, she actually came in, and she was in congestive heart failure. So as I mentioned again, her JVP was elevated, which is not normal in pregnancy. And we did a bedside echo and UDF was 32%. So my question to you is, how do we treat her? So she's 38 weeks, um, so she'd be started on beta blockade, ACE inhibitor, Lasix, and then referred for immediate C-section. Diuresis with furosemide, and then discharge home to await labor. Diuresis with furosemide, labor should be induced with plans for vaginal delivery if she remains stable, and she should receive an intraortic balloon pump to support her blood pressure um, and hemodynamics for a C-section. Okay, so um, just briefly to go through these, um, C-section is a decision made by cardiology and in this situation and OB together. There's very, usually we say <coughs> C-section is for obstetric indications. There's very few, very few cardiac reasons where we'd say you have to have a C-section. Potentially if someone's had a previous aortic dissection, we don't want them pushing if the aorta is big. Um, but normally we allow the OBs to decide how they're going to deliver. So she's in heart failure. Um, She's not unstable, um, so we didn't think that she needed an immediate C-section. ACE inhibitors are contraindicated during pregnancy at any point um, because it causes um, lots of problems with fetal development. Um, we, um, we would never send her home to wait spontaneous labor because you have a woman who's already has a viable baby who's pretty much at term, and um, there's really no benefit of making that baby gestate any longer. And obviously, we would not give her a balloon pump because of the obvious risks of that. She's hemodynamically stable. So what we just did with her is we stabilized her. She was in the um, ICU. We gave her Lasix and we induced labor for to try to do a spontaneous vaginal delivery. Now some of these women, we actually labor them in the intensive care unit. So my young lady with anthracycline cardiomyopathy, her first pregnancy was uh, a year and a half ago. We actually labored her in the ICU. Just in case everything hit the fan, um, we had everything available. We had people that knew how to put lines in. Um, we had a stat C-section cart ready. Um, it may be a little bit of overkill, but at least we're ready because you know it's a it's a difficult time, and you want the mother and the baby to do well. So we actually have regular rounds with our OBs and our maternal fetal medicine staff, where we have a risk of these very high risk women, and we discuss exactly what we're going to do if this happens, if this happens, if this happens, and uh, with anesthesia as well, so that we're prepared. Um, so if anything happens, we're ready. So. Um, and we have right now we have a risk of about very high risk women, uh, one of which was a lady that just delivered last week. We have a lady with VT, some Fontan patients, um, so that it does, she doesn't end up in labor and delivery and everyone's like not knowing what to do. We're, I think, being prepared because there's no doubt on a lot on how to treat these women, being prepared and understanding what could go wrong um, helps improve outcomes. So, this lady had a peripartum cardiomyopathy. Basically, it is a diagnosis of exclusion. We don't know that she didn't have a cardiomyopathy entering her pregnancy. She could have had an idiopathic viral dilated cardiomyopathy. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. Usually, it presents towards the end of pregnancy or the first few months postpartum. If you have a low EF in your first and second trimester, that's really not peripartum. It usually happens later on in pregnancy. It's one in 3,000 to 4,000 pregnancies. Believe it or not, in Haiti, it's one in 300. And we have a cardiologist, one of our colleagues who goes down to Haiti and does work there, and he's like, it's amazing how many of these people he's seeing. So as we see more Haitians in our population, you need to always consider that. Um, uh, so we think it's probably genetics. Yeah, okay. probably genetics. Again, we don't really know why people get this, but it's probably genetics. So in our country, it's lowest in Hispanics, um, though the incidence is rising in our country, so we'll be seeing more of these. The predisposing factors are multiparity, multiple childbirths, really young age of pregnancy and really high age of pregnancy, um, malnutrition, so maybe that's part of the Haitian, um, potentially, um, and um, smoking, diabetes, the usual risk factors. And we don't really know what the mechan like why some people get it, but it's felt to be a prolactin issue, so they get um, oxidative stress, which leads to the pro proleolytic cleavage of prolactin, which actually causes myocardial apoptosis. That's felt to be the mechanism. So heart failure can develop rapidly, um, but generally if women survive the initial 
insult, they do better than patients with dilated cardiomyopathy, and a significant proportion of their EFs go back to normal within the first six months postpartum. Um, so if you're going to do things like a transplant or a defibrillator, you might want to wait until the six month point to see how much they're going to recover. The predictors of recovery are ob they're obvious. So if you're more sick, you're less likely to recover. If your LV is bigger, you're less likely to recover. If your EF is lower, and low BNP and low troponin actually are good things. They're, they're, you're more likely to recover. And if you get diagnosed after delivery, that's a better prognostic sign as well. So if the mother's unstable, you need to always save the mother first. You need to just deliver the baby. Um, this lady was 38 weeks. Um, deliver the baby, and then you can. Then once the baby's out, you can do anything you want to the mother. You can give her ACE inhibitors. You can diurese her. You can, you know, do anything you want. If the EF is low, so generally you lose a cutoff of 30%, then you need to anticoagulate because of the risk of LV thrombus, and this is a hypercoagulable state. So you would uh, anticoagulate with a, a, a low molecular heparin. You use usual medical therapy, so eight, but you can't use ACE or ARBs. Um, though if you're breastfeeding, you can use an ACE inhibitor. Um, we had a, one of our heart failure doctors has a lady with an EF of 30% who um, wanted to become pregnant. And 30%, we're not really crazy about that number, but she really wanted to get pregnant. Again, this whole situation of you can tell them what you would like, but women, it's their individual decision if they want to have a baby or not. So he basically took her off all her ACEs and ARBs and maximized her hydralazine and nitrates to like the maximum possible doses and then said, okay, now you can get pregnant. And she's actually going to deliver in the next month. She's done actually pretty well throughout her pregnancy. Um, use di if you need to save the mother, if the mother's in pulmonary edema, just give them diuretics, Lasix. Just, you need, if you need to save it, you need to save the mother first. Um, I find that postpartum in some of these women, if I use diuretics, the breast milk isn't as vigorous. Um, but again, we're just trying to keep the mother stable as well. We generally would plan a vaginal delivery for these women unless they're unstable. And there is some data suggesting that breastfeeding is actually not great in this situation. Um, because of the prolactin issue, um, there in some um, animal models, the animals that didn't breastfeed potentially did better. I don't know if that's enough of a blanket statement to tell these women not to breastfeed because there's so many benefits of breastfeeding, but it's an individualized decision. This lady decided not to breastfeed um, um, for lots of reasons. Um, and again, as I mentioned, if you're going to wait, you're going to wait at least six months to decide if you're going to have an ICD or a transplant. All right, so these are the big studies looking at how to manage peripartum cardiomyopathy. So the immunoglobulin study was only six patients. I'm not even going to men mention it. We don't even use it. Um, pentoxifiline does prevent apoptosis. Um, there's a 30 patient studies. EFs did better in this group of women, but there's no other studies, and we really don't know if it's safe during pregnancy. Bromokiptine was actually thought to be um, promising because it's a prolactin blocker because we think it's a prolactin issue. 20 patient study, EFs were much, really def much better, and there was a lower mortality in the treatment group. But bromocryptine also suppresses milk reduction on a production. You know, don't really, I don't really care that much about that. But there is a risk of an acute MI using bromocryptine, so we don't use that as well. So there's nothing unique about peripartum cardiomyopathy in terms of medical management other than avoid ACEs and ARBs during pregnancy. So then the issue is we have a woman, um, this lady may want to get pregnant again. What do you tell her? So um, there's two camps here, or two situations. One is if your EF goes back to normal, and one is if your EF stays low. So if your EF goes back to normal and you get pregnant again, there's no chance you're going to die next pregnancy. But there's a 14% chance your EF will go back down, or, sorry, 20% chance that you'll, your EF will fall and 40% that it'll stay down, and a 21% chance you'll develop heart failure symptoms. So you just present this data to your patients and let them decide. If, however, your EF does not go back to normal, if you get pregnant again, there's a 50% chance you'll have heart failure again, 25% that your EF will fall more than 20%, 25%, and 31% that it won't go back to normal, and a 20% chance that you're going to die. So these women really should be advised not to get pregnant again. There are some studies looking at stress echo to preconception to evaluate your contractile reserve. Um, again, very small studies. Um, we don't really generally use that um, routinely. All right, and I want to end up on maternal placental syndrome. So I, you may not see all these um, crazy things I talked about today, but I guarantee you, even today, you might see a woman who's had a placental syndrome. So that's preeclampsia, eclampsia, placental abruption, placental infarction at some point in their life. And I love asking my women who are in their 50s and 60s who present with cardiac disease, did you have preeclampsia? And honestly, most of them say, yes, they did. Um, because we, do, we know now that preeclampsia doubles the risk of cardiovascular disease over your lifetime. And we've known that for almost 100 years. And if you deliver preterm um, and severe preeclampsia, your risk is the highest. So this is another Canadian study where they looked at a million women in Ontario, and about six, seven percent of them had a maternal placental syndrome, which is about what we see in our population—you know, less than ten percent. 
and they followed them up for eight years, and 61% of them had a relative increase in heart failure and arrhythmias. So if you look at this graph, those are women, black or women who had healthy pregnancies, you're more likely to have CHF or arrhythmia, heart failure, atrial dysrhythmia, or ventricular dysrhythmia if you had a, a maternal placental syndrome. So much so that the American Heart Association now has it in their guidelines that if you have gestational diabetes, another issue, preeclampsia or pregnancy-induced hypertension, it puts a women at risk for cardiovascular disease. So it's a cardiovascular risk factor. Um, perhaps it unmasks or it causes um, endothelial dysfunction. So it's a failed stress test of pregnancy. So you're a young woman, you get preeclampsia, your body's not, your, your body has, body has failed itself. So that's a failed stress test of pregnancy. Um, so again, just, just, it's interesting, just ask your patients out there. I just find it interesting. I, once, I was doing rounds with the fellows and there's a young woman with an MI and I asked that and the, the fellows thought I was like magical. Wow, how did you know she had preeclampsia? <laughs> so um, it's just, it's interesting. And, and I, if I see a woman with preeclampsia, I, um, I don't, we don't really know what to do with that. There is a clinic in Ontario where every woman who has one of these issues goes sees a cardiologist one month postpartum to do, review it. We don't really know what to do other than to tell them to exercise, lose weight, stay healthy. But you know it's a really difficult time. You have, you're a young mother, you have young children, and the last person you take care of is yourself. So maybe these women should just make a better job at trying to take care of themselves. But it's a, it's a significant issue. So I'm going to end with arrhythmias. So we see, the, if I see 100 patients with heart disease, um, you know, significant proportion of them are just palpitations, and the vast majority of them are benign. So premature beats and sustained tachyarrhythmias um, become more frequent or they manifest for the first time during pregnancy. There's very little use studies on the use of antiarrhythmics during pregnancy, and if you have a woman with an arrhythmia on an antiarrhythmic, you need to obviously decide preconception if they need to continue it or not. Amiodarone we do not want to use um, in pregnancy. Um, beta blockers generally can be used safely during pregnancy, so you have to discuss the the risk of the arrhythmia versus the risk of the medication. You can ablate someone during pregnancy, but you want to do it during the second trimester. So the first trimester, you don't want to ablate because of the radiation, and the third trimester because the heart gets shifted up and everything moves around. So second trimester is the best time to do that. And if you have an ICD or a pacemaker, you can get pregnant, no problem. Um, there's no re these themselves do not contraindicate pregnancy. And there is a mechanism to why arrhythmia is the most pregnant. These women aren't just crazy. They're not just feeling palpitations. There's really a reason why they feel that. So you have a hyperdynamic state. So your you know, primate patients who've never been pregnant before, they're not used to having their blood volume go up 30 to 50%. So they might just feel that. You also have atrial ventricular stretch because your left atrium, your left ventricle, they all get bigger. And this causes ion channels activation, membrane depolarization, the usual EP stuff that I learned in cardiology training and then I forgot because it doesn't really affect my daily life. Um, you get higher resting heart rate, um, so more extra heartbeats, decreased heart rate variability. And then again, the hormones have to play an effect here. So the estrogen increases myocardial alpha receptors, which constantly enhance automaticity and triggered activity. So I, we have a woman right now actually who has a right ventricular outflow tract um, RVOT um, VT um, because the RVOT tract was, has increased, it's caused stretch, and now she has VT during her pregnancy. I just treated her with beta blockers and she's actually done really well. So there's definitely a mechanism on why women have palpitations and they feel palpitations during pregnancy. Yes? So is that someone who would refer, refer for ablation? So no. So um, I just put her on beta blockers and I pr I'm assuming that once she delivers, these are going to go away. So we see women with SVT during their pregnancy, and our first line of treatment is basically, depending on how bad it is, maybe do nothing, give them beta blockers. And then um, our EP people have used flecainide during pregnancy as well. So, but we, uh, ablation would kind of be our, our later resort. So, um, okay, so hopefully I've been able to show you that there's a rising incidence of heart disease during pregnancy. I know you're seeing it here. We're definitely seeing it in Boston as well. Um, and ideally, we just see women with pre-existing heart disease before they get pregnant. All diseases are not created equal, so evaluation of maternal risk is key. Very, very limited data on most conditions. Um, when I talk to you about our patient with a stent, um, there's only case studies on uses of aspirin and plavix with stenting in uh, pregnant women. And moderate or high-risk patients require close collaboration with, between OB, anesthesia, and cardiology so that we can you know, um, plan for everything that could happen. So what happened to our patients? So our 42-year-old who had a cardiac arrest has two stents and is now pregnant is going to deliver in um, September, and her she's due date in September, which is less than one year since her last stent. And she, of course, she was on beta blockers, aspirin, statins, Plavix. So when we found out when she was pregnant, um, we stopped her statins because you cannot use statins during pregnancy. It's the one category X medication. We kept her on her beta blockers to you know. Fortunately, her EF was normal, but she did have some LV wall motion, so to you know. Um, 
um, that generally, generally you can use beta blockers during pregnancy. I prefer preferred beta blockers in metoprolol and labetalol. Atenolol we kind of stay away from. There are some studies showing that it increased risk of IUGR, though I think the OB people would maybe potentially argue that. And um, our worry with her is that she was overweight and that she was going to develop preeclampsia and diabetes. Um, and then she would end up in labor on aspirin and Plavix. We can't do an epidural with aspirin and Plavix. You can do it with aspirin, but not both. And then we don't want her to labor naturally because we don't want her to be in pain because that increases the, the stress on her heart. So we actually made the decision to stop her Plavix nine months after her last stent because um, we felt that was the risk of that was um, you know, favored the benefit of it. And exactly what happened, we thought would happen, happened. She went in, she developed preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, and ended up needing urgent delivery because of the preeclampsia. Um, but she actually did fine. Um, she's fine. And, uh, and then postpartum, we put her back on her statins. Our 32-year-old with multivalvular rheumatic disease, so she's a 32-year-old from Somalia, has MS, AS, AR, was asked to terminate because we were very worried about her. Um, and she did not want to. I literally saw her every two weeks during her pregnancy. We talked about her every month or two with the OB people. And, um, um, and we had everything planned. So but what happened is, do you remember that February, I don't know if it was when there, the Boston shut down because of the snowstorm? So there, you weren't allowed to drive on the roads in Boston even. And of course, um, she goes into heart failure that day, that Saturday. And she called 911 and the ambulance couldn't get down her street. Mm -hmm. So she walked down her street in heart failure <laughs> 35 weeks pregnant and met the ambulance. I was actually glad I was on call that weekend, so I met her in the emergency room. And so what we did with her is we um, uh, admitted her to um, the ICU. We diureased her, um, stabilized her, and then the, that was sun by Sunday night, we started to induce her with a plan for spontaneous, not spontaneous, induced vaginal delivery in the ICU so that anything happens, we were ready. Um, and everything actually was going fine. I saw her literally every hour during that day um, and the OB people. Everyone was very nervous that something bad was going to happen. Until something bad did happen, um, her fetus started um, you know, showing signs of distress. So we had an OR waiting for her. So this is, again, the planning. We had an OR waiting for her with a stat C-section cart. We brought her down. And um, again, I have huge respect for my OB colleagues because the OB nurse turned off the baby's monitor because the baby's heart rate was going down. And she's like, I can't watch this. And um, the, the OB person said scalpel, and literally like three seconds later, this baby comes out. It was, it was amazing. And he actually did fine. He, NICU team was ready. Um, he was resuscitated. He left the OR on room air. Um, and she, you know, she had a little bit of heart failure postpartum. We took her back to the ICU, and she's actually, she did really well. But I think because we were ready and prepared, um, I think that helped her outcome. Um, our 32 year with peripartum cardiomyopathy, I saw in follow-up, and her EF was 32%, and now it's 44%, so, and she's actually doing very well. The issue is how long to keep her on her ACE and beta blockers. The answer was we don't really know. Probably at least a year, if not indefinitely. Um, and um, again, if you have any questions, I love this stuff, and we want all these women to do well, so please, please, please email me. I don't mind. It doesn't bother me. If you want anyone to be seen preconception or, um, you know, even to help you during the process, I'm happy to answer emails, um, and I'm happy to answer questions now, too, so thank you very much. Yeah, so the question is, um, patient on, on aspirin and Plavix who needs a stat C-section, <coughs> what to do with the aspirin and Plavix, and how are they being anesthetized? So um, I think the the, definitely we keep them on aspirin. The issue with Plavix really depends on when their last stent was. So if it was a month ago, I would just say as, as soon as the OB people felt that the risk of bleeding was below the risk, you know, the risk of stent thrombosis is not like 100% per day, right? It's, you know, it's not over a year, it's high. It's not high though, it's not huge. So this lady with that lady, we actually didn't put her back on Plavix because by that time she was almost 10, 11 months post stents. We just kept her on aspirin. Now, the issue with anesthesia is, um, I actually leave a lot of that up to my, in we have OB anesthesia cardiology, you know, so we leave a lot of that up to them, um, whether they use general or epidural, um, but most of the time they've used um, epidurals, um, you know, or spinals, so, but we, we're lucky that we have that available to us and they're very good at what they do. No other questions? Excellent. All right. Thank you very much.